Oral questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are letting down Canadian farm families. Uh, not only are they imposing higher carbon taxes and failing to defend them against actions by the government in China, now the agriculture minister is claiming that farmers who are upset about being let down during this crisis just don't understand the programs that her government is putting forward. She claims that the $252 million of re-announced money for farmers is good enough. When will the Prime Minister put forward programs that actually work for farmers instead of telling them to be happy with what they've got? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, farmers across the country support us every day in the way they're putting food on our table in a quality, uh, with reliable quality, and we uh, need to continue to support them. We announced more than $77 million to support food processors during this crisis. To help cattle and hog producers, we launched a $125 million national agri-recovery initiative to help them adapt as they process less meat. We're also launching a surplus food purchase program, starting with a $50 million fund to help ensure farmers are being compensated for their hard work. For dairy producers, we will work to increase the Canadian Dairy Commission's line of credit by $200 million. We will continue to be there for our farmers. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Canada used to have a prince, uh, history of principled leadership on the world stage. The government of China has launched an unprecedented attack on the rights and freedoms of the people of Hong Kong. Now, this government should go beyond statements and should act in concert with our allies to show the government of China that they must abide by their commitments. Can the, will the Prime Minister unequivocally condemn the actions of the PRC and will he propose a real plan for supporting the people of Hong Kong and our allies around the world that have already started to be targeted by Chinese retribution? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada has always been very clear in standing up for human rights around the world, including uh, in regards to the Chinese government. We support the over 300,000 Canadians who live in Hong Kong and support uh, all people of Hong Kong as they look to continue the one country, two systems uh, rule that has been in place uh, in uh, Hong Kong and China for uh, a number of, for a uh, couple of decades now. We will continue to stand up strongly for human rights on the world stage, working with our allies and holding others to account we call for a de-escalation of tensions uh, and uh, for the Chinese government to listen to citizens in Hong Kong who have important things to say. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. A concrete way that the Prime Minister could actually support the people of Hong Kong is to unequivocally condemn the actions of the communist regime in Beijing. They are the ones who are violating the one country, two systems principle. And this Prime Minister is refusing to condemn those actions and refusing to propose any kind of plan to support our allies ac across the world. Now, when Russia invaded Ukraine, Canada, under a conservative government, led the world in promoting a series of coordinated economic and political measures that punished and isolated the Putin regime and sent the clear message that violations of international law will not be re uh, tolerated. Will the Prime Minister condemn the actions of the PRC and propose a meaningful plan to support the people of Hong Kong? And Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have expressed in no uncertain terms our deep concern over the measures proposed uh, by the People's Republic of China in regards to Hong Kong. We stand with the people in Hong Kong who believe uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly continues to be an essential part uh, of their way of life. We will continue to work with our allies all around the world uh, to stand up for human rights, including in Hong Kong. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Why is it so hard for this Prime Minister to condemn the actions of the Communist government in China? This, gov this Prime Minister has let Canada get bullied and pushed around on the world stage. Two Canadians are being held illegally. The government of China put blocks on Canadian exports. All the while, this Prime Minister has done nothing. And now the PRC is violating the one China, two systems policy and violating the rights and freedoms of the people of Hong Kong. Why is it so hard? What is he so afraid of to stand up to the PRC? Why does he continue with a policy of appeasement? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. 
Speaker, my job as, Cana Can as Prime Minister is to stand up for Canadians, is to be there uh, to defend the rights of Canadians and protect Canadians both at home and abroad. That is why we have been unequivocal in our defence of the two Michaels arbitrarily detained in China. We've continued to work uh, to resolve that situation. We will continue to stand up uh, for the Canadians' rights, for Canadian interests, including agricultural producers and exporters. We will continue to defend Canadian interests everywhere around the world, including with China. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The problem is, Mr. Speaker, is that he has actually done nothing to stand up to Canadians. What did he do after two Canadians were held illegally by the PRC? He still wrote that check to the Asian Infrastructure Bank, Mr. Speaker, still gave that institution Canadian taxpayers' money to help further the advancements of the foreign policy of China. And now here we are today, and he refuses to condemn these actions. These are actions that have been condemned by governments around the world, by uh, public policy institutions. Why is it so hard for him to just call this out for what it is? An abuse of the rights and freedoms of the people of Hong Kong. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we put out a very strong statement alongside the government of the UK and of Australia uh, with uh, our deep disagreement over the measures put forward uh, proposed by China for Hong Kong. We will continue to defend uh, the rights of people in Hong Kong, particularly the 300,000 Canadians who live there. Uh, we continue uh, to defend Canadian interests around the world, including in regards to China. Honourable député de Belleuil-Chambly. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quebec has an economic fabric which is special because over the last decades, a fantastic um, uh, fabric of small and medium sized industries has been built up, which is now being threatened by the pandemic. And many of these companies might be built by larger companies and foreign companies. It's a problem. One hundred, two hundred, or three hundred thousand dollars could help save some of these small companies, but that money instead is going to go into the coffers of the Liberal Party of Canada. Will the Prime Minister immediately commit to not dipping into the uh, wage subsidy program? The Right Honourable, the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have created a wage subsidy program to help companies and nonprofit organizations, as well as others, to retain their employees during the pandemic. We know that workers in different kinds of organizations need to keep on paying their rent and buy groceries. And that is why we have put in place this wage subsidy for all organizations and companies which need the money. We need our economy to come back strong at the end of this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Quebec as a whole is listening to the answers and the non answers of the Prime Minister. Let's be serious. A program is for someone who needs it, but a rich political party, which raised about $3 million in the first quarter, does not need that money. So, can we keep that money and send it to small businesses in Quebec? Between 30 and 50 percent of these companies might go bankrupt. Uh, so instead of leaving the money uh, for the Liberal Party of Canada, the Right Honourable, the Prime Minister of Canada. Mr. Speaker, we have created programs to help workers across the country, be it the um, Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which is helping 8 million people across the country, be it the Wage Subsidy Program, which is helping workers as well. We have made investments to uh, provide credit to small businesses, and we will continue to make sure that companies and workers who need it receives, receive the support they need during the crisis. Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, We've seen that in this country, Canadians have to make an impossible choice. When they're sick, without paid sick leave, they have to choose between going to work and potentially risking infecting their coworkers or staying at home and not knowing if they can pay the bills. Will the Prime Minister commit to immediately putting in place a guarantee that all Canadians can receive paid sick leave? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we agree that nobody should have to choose between staying home with COVID-19 symptoms or being able to afford rent or groceries. 
That's why the government will continue discussions with the provinces without delay on ensuring that as we enter the recovery phase of the pandemic, every worker in Canada who needs it has access to 10 days of paid sick leave a year. We will also consider other mechanisms for longer term to support workers with sick leave. We thank the Leader of the NDP and the entire NDP caucus for working with us on this issue. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much for that response. On a obtenu un engagement. We got a commitment from the Prime Minister to help Canadian men and women living with disabilities. It's been weeks and no action has been taken. When will the Prime Minister provide assistance for people living with a disability? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that people who are living with a disability are more vulnerable to the current economic circumstances due to COVID-19 and face additional costs. We have to help them. We have implemented certain measures. We've set up an advisory committee that will help us respond to the needs of that community. We know that we have to do more and we will do more and we are working on the ways to assist Canadians living with a disability. Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. The plan the Liberals are presenting on how members of Parliament can do their job in this place does not include a return to Parliament. The Liberals want a glorified committee with stunted duties and limited powers. It's a fake Parliament, which I guess is not a surprise coming from these Liberals. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Prime Minister is this. If he thinks it's okay for us to be here four days a week, face to face, in a glorified committee, why is it not okay for us to be here, like we are today, having real Parliament? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we are here today, and we'll be here four days a week, Mr. Speaker, taking questions from the opposition, as we did the week before and the week before. And instead of having normal sitting with um, an average of 190 questions, last week and the week before, we had over 300 questions, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because we consider that the role of parliamentarians is fundamental. The opposition needs to play a role. The government plays its role. That's how democracy works. Here, here. Well, opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are very happy to ask questions. It would appear the Prime Minister doesn't really like to answer them, but we're very happy to continue to ask those questions. But, Mr. Speaker, as we are preparing to come out of this pandemic, we have an economic recovery that we need to see. We could see a possible second wave of the pandemic. Is it not more important than ever that Parliament, with all of its powers, including opposition days, private members' business, and the business that Parliament does happen in this place? Place, and not just this so-called glorified committee that's really the Liberals trying to pass off a fake Parliament, which it is not. Mr. Speaker, do, does the government believe that Parliament is essential? The Honourable Government House Leader. What's essential, Mr. Speaker, is for the opposition to be able to ask questions. It's essential that the committees, it's essential the committees can work. For example, in recent weeks, we had 74 meetings of different committees, 580 witnesses, 23 appearances by ministers, Mr. Speaker. This is crucial because this, this is our democracy. We always defend our democracy at the same time that we respect the directions by our health expert, Mr. Speaker. We're here to answer questions and we're pleased to answer those questions. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. An exceptional situation requires exceptional measures. Given the pandemic in Canada, we accept that the government could invest billions of dollars and that could lead to a deficit. However, we need to know where we're headed. The parliamentary budget officer indicated that $250 billion would be the deficit and that was on uh, April 30th, 25 days later today. Can the government tell us how high the deficit is going to go? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind this House and my colleague for Louis Saint Laurent, we're going through an extremely serious crisis. Thousands, millions of Canadians are worried about their health and have lost their jobs. Although we are in an 
uncertain situation and we have a great deal of worries, we will do everything we can to help Canadians get through this crisis. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. I want to understand, I understand what the President of the Treasury Board said, but that wasn't my question. And he came here to this House to answer questions. What will the deficit be? The Parliamentary Budget Officer was talking about $250 billion, which is enormous, but that was 25 days ago. 25 days of expenditures later, what will be Canada's deficit? The Honourable Minister. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. No Canadian should have to worry about paying their bills, the additional child care, or putting food on the table at this time. Canada had a strong fiscal position. Canada is ready and able to respond to the challenges of COVID-19. Now is this time to act. We will be unwavering in our support to families, our health care system, and our economy. We are in this together, and our government is prepared to use whatever means necessary to keep our economy strong and stable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Foothills. Mr. Speaker, even before COVID-19, Canadian farm families were struggling. Farm revenues fell, farm revenues fell by 45% in 2018, the largest drop in Canadian history. And during a pandemic, the Liberals increase a carbon tax on farmers and don't offer any assistance for an essential industry. The situation is dire. Planting is down 25%, 30,000 farms are at risk of bankruptcy. So during a financial crisis, why do the Liberals feel the best lifeline for Canadian farmers is an online calculator? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I want to remind everyone that in Canada, we have risk management programs that are already available. And those risk management programs have been improved through various complementary programs. Within those programs, usually $1.6 billion is available to producers, and that's why I say that this remains the first line. That's where the first application must be made. However, we are continuing to add funds and open new programs. Agri-recovery is an example. $15 million was available in previous years, and now $125 is available. Hills. Mr. Speaker, the minister obviously doesn't understand how dire and desperate the situation is for Canadian farmers and agri-food businesses. Her response to farmers is they just don't understand the programs. What programs? An online calculator? More debt? How out of touch can the Liberals possibly be? The business risk management programs were never designed for a global pandemic. Instead of insulting farmers, why won't the minister listen to them and design a program they can actually use? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will never insult farmers. I have too much respect for them, and I spend a great deal of time with them right now. They are the heart of my riding, and so I have a great deal of respect for farmers. Do not doubt it. We are going to improve our programs. Let me give you an example. The uh, business emergency account. This account was available for the agricultural sector, but we were told several times that many small businesses could not access it. That's why we broadened the criteria. And now small producers can access it. That represents more than $670 million in terms of direct transfers. Thank you. Chambly. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. I'm starting to understand, Mr. Speaker, why the Liberal Party would not like to hold a real question period. The Prime Minister says we're taking the wage subsidy and we're keeping it. He's saying to fishers in eastern Quebec, the money that you need, I'm keeping it. He says to small businesses in Belleuil or in the riding of Papineau, the money that you need, I'm keeping some of it for me. He's telling people who run hotels, I'm keeping money. He's telling hotel owners, go on a website and we'll confirm that you can't access this money. It makes no sense. Will the Prime Minister restore a little bit of good sense and say that the Liberal Party will renounce its claim to the wage subsidy? Mr. Speaker, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy is there to help workers through this time. Workers deserve that assistance so that they don't have to worry about food on the table or how to weather through this difficult time. We want to support all employers, which is why the wage subsidy is available, whether you are a not-for-profit or a for-profit business. This is to help Canadian workers through this very difficult time, and we're going to continue supporting Canadian workers through this period. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Liberals collected nearly $3 million in the first months of this year. The Conservatives collected four. They've got a full house. They can pay their staff. And yet, they're asking families to chip in to pay. Why? Partisanship. Ask Quebecers. They're asking Quebecers who have lost their jobs to pay their staff because they don't want to dip into their election fund. Here's my question. Why is it so difficult for a Liberal to stay away from the candy bowl? Minister, the Honourable Minister. I think everyone agrees that COVID-19 has been very hard on Canadians. We've asked Canadians to do something very extraordinary through this period to fight COVID-19. And workers are at the very heart of this. The Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy is there to help our hard-working Canadians so that they can be supported during this difficult time. We're going to continue to do that, irrespective of what sector, irrespective of what size your organization is. We're going to help Canadian workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Deputy de Salaberry sur Roy. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roy. What's cynical? is that Conservatives abolished public funding of political parties. And when the Bloc tabled a bill to re-establish it, the Liberals voted against it. They voted against the democratic and transparent funding based on votes. But today, shamelessly, both millionaire parties are dipping into taxpayers' money. They should rethink the basis of the public funding of political parties. But right now, will the Prime Minister ask his party to repay what was taken? The Honourable Minister. During this difficult period of COVID-19, I think all of us have uh, something to be really proud of, and that is we have all worked together, bandied together as Canadians to help support our businesses, our organizations, and most importantly, Canadians and Canadian workers, so that they don't have to think about where they're going to get their next meal or how they're going to pay for the roof over their head. During this difficult period, we're going to continue to support Canadians and workers, and that's what the wage subsidy is doing for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Mr. Speaker, more than two months ago, the finance minister promised the energy sector a very important thing, and that is, he said, help was on the way, that it would be there within hours, possibly days. Well, it's two months later and there's still no help. Loans were promised, but those aren't able to be accessed. Businesses are shutting down, jobs are being lost, and workers are unable to provide for their families. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about death by delay for one of Canada's key industries. My question is very simple. Where's the help? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, the oil sector and its workers continue to be affected by COVID-19 and the global surge in oil supply. We have taken action to create jobs through the remediation of orphan and abandoned wells, a program that has seen tens of thousands of applications in Alberta and Saskatchewan. We are supporting the sector as well with a 75 per cent wage subsidy to keep Canadians working. We have also provided access through the BCAP and the LEAF program, which provide access to loans to the oil sector. So we are doing everything to help the oil and gas sector. Number four, Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, the commercial rent assistance program is letting down small business. Chris, in my riding of Kelowna, has a small women's clothing store, and she has just been handed an evictions notice. Chris says she's been paying her rent consistently for the last 10 years and has paid her portion under this program. Her Vancouver landlord does not want to participate in the rent assistance program. The Liberals have put all of the onus on the landowners and leaving the tenants at their mercy. How are the Liberals going to fix this flawed program so that small business owners like Chris aren't forced to close? The Honourable Minister for Small Businesses. Mr. Speaker, that business and every small business across the country is at the very heart of the programs and the support that we have put out to help them. The application today has gone up so that landlords can apply to this. We urge landlords to apply to this, work with their small business tenant so that the small business can get the 75% rent relief. We know how important this expense is, and that is why we have a program that we've worked with provinces and territories to design so that our small businesses can weather this difficult time. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Mr. Speaker, weeks after they were first announced, the Liberal Small Business Relief Program still need effective changes. 
the SIBA loans can only be accessed with a business checking account. The wage subsidy excludes consultants, contractors, and punishes owner-operators and discourages revenue growth. The Commercial Rent Relief Program opens today, further strains landlord relations through its design. These programs need changes and they need to be changed fast. When will the government listen to distressed small business owners and improve their flawed programs? Minister. Mr. Speaker, right from the very beginning, you will see, and I think the Honourable Member agrees, that we have put programs out to support our small businesses and we have adapted by listening to them, which is why over 630,000 small businesses have seen a loan of $40,000. More, thousands more will be helped. The Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy is helping them keep their employees with a 75% assistance. The Emergency Rent Program is also going to help them with that important operating cost. So in measure after measure, we are, well, we are completely focused on helping Canada's small businesses get through this difficult time. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. The SARS outbreak triggered preparations for a new global threat pandemic influenza. The Public Health Agency was established to provide a focal point for federal leadership in public health emergencies. And there was a national emergency strategic stockpiling of pandemic response supplies, including personal protective equipment. Mr. Speaker, on top of the 2 million N95 masks that were sent to landfills in Regina, how many other pieces of personal protective equipment were thrown out when this Liberal government shut down and consolidated three of Canada's 11 emergency warehouses? Of health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the member knows, we've been working together with provinces and territories to make sure that we can keep Canadians, including those on the front line, safe from contracting COVID-19. And that includes working with them to ensure that they, we can supplement their own stockpiles of PPE and medical equipment. We've been able to so far fulfill all requests from provinces and territories, and the National Emergency Stockpile is still meeting its 24-hour delivery target. As we've said before, we will review the National Emergency Stockpile but right now our response is making sure that Canadians have the equipment they need. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Palantir is a surveillance giant that is notorious in the United States for its work with the CIA and in deporting migrants. But now they've been cutting themselves in on the business of tracing and tracking COVID patients. Now Palantir's head honcho in Canada is David McNaughton, the Prime Minister's personal friend, and he's been bragging about all his meetings with top Liberals but he's not even registered to lobby. So the Prime Minister gave our medical supply chain to Amazon. Is he going to give the private medical information to Canadian citizens to a company with such a dubious human rights record as Palantir? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have put in place a number of relationships with suppliers, domestic and international, to make sure that Canada has the personal protective equipment it needs. In addition, we are working with domestic industry to make sure that we have contact tracing and, and, and um, other assistance ready to be able to make sure we are protecting Canadians and making sure that they will be able to identify contact um, the, the virus as it spreads. The Honourable Member for Saint-Léonard, Saint-Michel. Communities exist beyond the reach of government and established charitable programs. These communities often create their own networks of non-profits as well as community responses. This is the case of many black and African Canadian organizations in my riding of Saint-Léonard, Saint-Michel and across the country. Can the Minister of Families children and social development provide information as to how these organizations are being supported during this pandemic. Excellent. Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. Let me begin by wishing you and all Canadians from coast to coast to coast a very happy Africa Day. Charities have always been there for Canadians in times of need, and we will be there for them. That is why we're investing $350 million in an emergency community support fund uh, including uh, serving uh, black-led and black-serving uh, non-profit organizations. We're also moving forward on our $25 million black community initiative to help build capacity and invest in infrastructure to better serve black Canadian community organizations. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. 
you very much, Mr. Speaker. Women are facing unique challenges during this pandemic. We know that rates of domestic violence and sexual assault have been increased. Women have lost their jobs in multiple sectors, especially in the tourism uh, and hospitality sector, and many of these women are working part-time. And at a time when we need it most, money has been cut from human trafficking by this government. The government is failing on all fronts. When will the government fix these gaps to ensure Canadian women are protected from the fallout of this crisis and make their programs work for all women? Our rule minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the honourable member for that really important question. We know that women are disproportionately affected during COVID-19, which is why we have invested $50 million to support women's shelters and sexual assault centres. And for women entrepreneurs across the country who are wearing so many hats right now during COVID-19, we are also helping support those ecosystems that are supporting those very women-led businesses and those entrepreneurs so that they can access the programs and be supported during this difficult time. And the work continues. Thank you. Well, member for Flamborough Glenbrook. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Because of this Prime Minister's flawed policies, wives, husbands, children of Canadians are being denied entry and turned back at the border. These families have been separated for two months now while the Liberals refuse to fix their mistake. What's worse, the Liberal member for Spadina, Fort York, is telling people to contact their MP to try to find a way to get an exemption. Here's a better idea. Why don't you change the directive and fix the problem? Bad Liberal policies calling, causing undue hardship. When will these mothers, fathers, and children finally be reunited with their families? <laughs> the Minister for Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I'm sure everyone in this, in this House is aware, that in response to the COVID uh, crisis, we've taken a number of extraordinary measures at the border. And while Canadian citizens and permanent residents are at all times admissible and are required to quarantine upon entry, foreign nationals are subject to additional travel restrictions and for an ind individual to be eligible to travel to Canada, their travel must be considered essential, consistent with the emergency order. Mr. Speaker, it is not our intention ever to separate families. Each situation is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Based on the information made available to our Border Services officers, we are working very closely with our provincial and territorial partners on the concern raised by the member opposite. Thank you. Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in January, instead of saving PPE for our health care workers, the health minister decided to ship it off to Communist China. And this just added to Beijing's growing stockpile. Now the Liberals are desperately trying to procure millions of masks. Where from? China. When they actually get a shipment, they're defective and can't be used. Can the minister guarantee that her lack of ensuring the availability of the N95 masks and in no way contributed to the 29 plus cases with our armed forces personnel supporting our seniors in their homes. The Honourable Minister. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, but is she slightly uh, misguided in terms of her understanding of our PPE acquisitions? We have multiple supply chains operating domestically and internationally. We have published our numbers on our website. We are planning for the short and the long term to make sure we leave no stone unturned to provide Canadians and Canadian frontline health care workers with the PPE they need to get Canada through this pandemic and beyond. Thank you. Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the 1,700 plus troops who put themselves in harm's way on the COVID-19 front lines and working in our long-term care facilities. We have to make sure that they have enough training and high-quality PPE to not only care for our loved ones during this pandemic, but to also protect themselves. This is hazardous work, and at least 29 members of the Canadian Armed Forces have become infected with COVID-19. Will the government guarantee danger pay for each and every one of our troops who are serving in Operation Laser? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the question. And first of all, I want to, to join the member in thanking our Canadian Armed Forces for the extraordinary work that they are doing in both Quebec and Ontario. They are saving Canadian lives. And we have also made extraordinary efforts to ensure that they have access to the personal protection equipment and the training that they need to be safe while doing their job. But as the member indicates, a number of them have fallen ill from this illness. And we have had discussions with uh, the, the, the general responsible, and he assures us that 
every effort is being made to acknowledge and recognize and support the members that are doing that work and that their pay reflects that. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you sell a service and you can't deliver, you refund the client. Air Canada and other airlines need to understand that. It's the law in Quebec. And now, over 25,000 people have signed a petition to demand refunds for cancelled flights. They're angry and they have reason to be. Air Canada has already gotten $800 million from the government and wants even more taxpayer money to save itself. Will the government clearly tell this company no refund means no help? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I understand very well the frustration of those who would have preferred a refund. The situation is far from ideal. At the same time, if every airline immediately refunded every flight that was cancelled, the effect would be catastrophic at a time when the air industry is missing 90% of its revenue. That's why our department proposed a solution to offer a credit that would be good for two years. Mr. Speaker, when this pandemic is over, we still want to have an airline industry left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's funny, last week, when I asked the question about the Transportation Bureau, there was a refusal to comment on those decisions. In Europe, airline companies are refunding their clients. In the United States, they're refunding their clients. Air Canada, which is really not on the edge of bankruptcy, has a great deal of money that belongs to its clients. They have enough money in their account to last for a year. And yet they're benefiting from the wage subsidy and they've been offered $800 million more. What do they have to do to get to, what do people have to do to get a reimbursement? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, in spite of what my colleague is saying, the situation in Europe, in the United States, is not as clear as it seems today. The situation is very difficult for every airline. And it must be said that the Transportation Office is a quasi-judicial body that makes decisions for consumers. It's had to make very difficult decisions, and it recommends extending credits that would be good for up to two years. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Nova West. Mr. Speaker, the role of the Auditor General is significant for Canadians. They provide fact-based information and expert advice on government activities. An Auditor General has never said that their budget is insufficient to meet the increased workload and follow up on the Liberal government's out-of-control expenditures. When will the Auditor General's budget be fully funded? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for his question. I would like to congratulate the new Auditor General, and I wish to assure our new Auditor General of our full support. This role is extremely important in terms of providing information and follow-up and analysis, especially in a difficult context like the one of COVID-19. We will, of course, take note of all the information and suggestions that the Auditor General has to offer us. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And quite honestly, the answer says we're going to look at it. We're not necessarily going to do it. So my question, Mr. Speaker, that no Auditor General has ever had to cut audits under any Prime Minister until now. And the government should be ashamed of that. We know that Liberals are not fans of Auditor Generals. I mean, who could forget when Sheila Frazier blew the whistle on this Liberal sponsorship scandal? It's clear that the work of the Auditor General is critical to the functioning of our democracy. When will the government give the Auditor General the money it needs to audit Liberal spending? The Honourable President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That allows me to say in English what I said briefly in French, which is that we are 
uh, congratulating, of course, the new Auditor General. We are fully uh, supportive of her important role. However, there is something that the member unfortunately said incorrectly, that the, what happened in terms of cuts was previous to 2015, he might remember that, when indeed the former government did cut the budget of the Auditor General, we increased it in 2018. Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Grasswood. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are well aware that this Prime Minister and his government have a troubled relationship with transparency. Now Canada's Information Commissioner is calling the limitations that departments face to fill access of information requests are, quote, ridiculous. Information requests have grinded to a halt. A pandemic is not really an excuse to hide information from Canadians. And if anything, Mr. Speaker, it's a reason to be more transparent. When will the Liberals restart this processing of access to information? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. I have been in contact with the Commissioner and we agreed on the importance of access to information, particularly during the current crisis. Canadians need to be informed, guided, and reassured under the circumstances. And we're aware of the difficulties in the, pub the workers in the public service are facing, but we have full confidence in public servants so that all Canadians get access to the information they need. Anna Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we know that Indigenous people who live off-reserve and in urban centres often face very different, unique challenges. I would like to ask the Minister for Indigenous Services what the government is doing to help Indigenous people who live off-reserve during this time of pandemic. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, in Indigenous people living in urban centres do indeed fa face a unique set of needs and challenges. We heard loud and clear that more support would be needed for Indigenous organizations working and operating in urban centres. And that's why last week's announcement by the Prime Minister of an additional $75 million for organizations supporting First Nations, Inuit and Métis living and working in, in, in urban areas off reserve marks a, a five-fold increase in that initial funding. This new funding will support Indigenous community-based solutions that address critical needs during this crisis to fight COVID-19 and to serve Indigenous populations living off reserve, principally in urban areas. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the Prime Minister has set his sights on law-abiding firearm owners. With a stroke of a pen, the Liberal ban takes firearms out of the hands of law-abiding hunters, sports shooters and farmers. While doing nothing, I said nothing to tackle crime. The buyback program is a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars, money that would be better spent on fighting gangs and stopping gun smuggling operations. Mr. Speaker, when will this government stop punishing law-abiding firearms owners and crack down on criminals? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by just repeating that the weapons that we have prohibited are not weapons for hunting and sport shooting, but rather weapons that were designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers in combat. And I'm interested in the, the member opposite's co comments about support for the police in their gun and gang investigations. And when we brought forward a program of $347 million to support the, those investigations, the member opposite's party voted against it. When we, when we brought forward measures to strengthen our border response with additional officers, additional technologies and resources, once again, they voted against it. Mr. Speaker, we'll be bringing forward strong new gun control legislation, and I look forward for the support from the member who seems now concerned about gun violence in our communities. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse-Lesechemin-Lévis. Canada had one of the strictest arms registries in the world, and when Liberals were going after law-abiding hunters and gun users, instead of putting their finger on the real source of the problem, like the former safety minister said, criminal gangs and traffickers were the real target. Why isn't the minister dealing with the real problem instead of hassling law-abiding people and affecting a tourism industry that needs support, not a kick in the rear? 
The Honourable Minister. To be clear, I have nothing but respect for law-abiding hunters and farmers in this country and people engaged in sport shooting, but we know that many of the firearms that end up on our streets are smuggled across the border, but a very significant number of those people using these guns for crimes are also getting their guns in Canada. Those guns are often stolen from, from lawful gun owners, and tragically, some are also diverted from people who buy them legally and sell, then sell them illegally. Mr. Speaker, we are going to bring in stronger gun control legislation after many Conservative efforts to weaken gun control legislation. But we're also going to invest in law enforcement and bring in new authorities with respect to the border, with respect to theft, and with respect to the diversion of guns into the hands of criminals. Member for Halliburton, Quartha Lakes, Brock. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' secret deal, deal with a handful of hereditary chiefs has split the Wet'suwet'en community. The situation has become so dire, Indigenous leaders are now calling for the resignation of the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Knowing full well that the Wet'suwet'en hadn't been properly consulted, right. knowing that there were governance challenges within the community, and hearing the call of elected chiefs to delay, not cancel, the announcement, why did the minister circumvent the Wet'suwet'en people and abandoned her duty to consult? The Minister for Indigenous Services. Speaker, as the member well knows, the Memorandum of Understanding establishes a path forward for substantive discussions towards final agreements describing future governance and implementation of a Wet'suwet'en rights and title. It's not an agreement on the implementation and crystallization of those rights, but a shared commitment to begin that work. Any such agreement, once reached, would be taken back to all Wet'suwet'en people for approval through a process that must clearly demonstrate the consent of the members of that nation. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is regarding the plan the government has in place to support families struggling because of COVID-19. Across the country, families, and especially parents, with children have had to deal with the challenges that arise from uncertainty about the future. I have heard from many parents in my writing in need of additional support. My question is to the Minister of Families and Children and Social Development. Could you inform us of any specific actions the government has taken to directly support parents with children during this difficult time? Well, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Honourable Member for the uh, really important question. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has placed immense pr pressure on Canadian families. That is why we made the decision as a government to increase the May payment under the Canada Child Benefit. I'm happy to announce to this House that last week, millions of Canadian parents received an additional $300 per child under the Canada Child Benefit. In addition to that, in July, Mr. Speaker, we will be increasing the Canada Child Benefit once again to take into consideration the increase in the cost of living for as long as uh, the, the parents are facing these pressures, our government will be there for them and will take care of them. Uh, Deputy de Rosemont -La the Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of organizations across Canada including Access Climate Canada, have sent a clear message. We cannot go back to normal after the COVID-19 pandemic. We have always advocated major investment in public transit and other things. So the restart has to deal with climate change and inequalities. Going back to the way things were is not an option. We need the Green New Deal. Will this government undertake to build a greener and more equitable society for all. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, in these times when we're dealing with the most important global problem in current history, which is COVID-19, we're doing everything we can do to support the vast majority of Canadians. But at the same time, we remain aware that there's another major global challenge, and that is the environment. So we are not forgetting about the importance of continuing, because we are committed. We have undertaken to do our fair share for the environment. For Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Municipalities are the decision-making level that is closest to the people that we serve. They are key to maintaining safe communities and ensuring essential services for one's quality of life. However, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities sounded the alarm more than a month ago. The pandemic is pushing municipalities to the brink of financial crisis. Critical services are at risk. Can the minister confirm if and when municipalities across this country will receive emergency federal support to face the impact of this pandemic? When will they be given the means to recover and rebuild? Thank you. 
Honorable President. The Honorable President of the Treasury Board. Mentioning the important role of municipalities, not only in the current crisis, but of course when we exit from it. Municipalities have not only the responsibilities, but not, we also need the tools to reinvest in our communities, and we will be there to help them, of course, always in collaboration and with the full support of provinces and territories. And that's all the questions we have to, for today.